Stephen Thomas, he's CTO of Ripple. Uh, Aaron Wright, he's a law professor at Cordoza, I believe. Uh, Anthony Donfrio, you have got the D'Onofrio. D'Onofrio. <laughs> he's with uh, Ethereum. And Stephen, uh, you're with. I have a blog into fluidity. Blog. That's <laughs> I um, to Actually, I'm gonna, I have a citation I want to mention about that in a bit. So uh, just to give you an idea, historically with, with blockchain so far, we've had uh, three S's. Uh, the first big app was Satoshi Dice. It had like 48% of network traffic in its height early 2013. Um, then Silk Road, which at, uh, at one point in 2012 had uh, like half a million coins. That was in the court cases last week that they were talking about in one wallet. Uh, and that was actually on Mt. Gox, apparently. That's how he's doing hedging. And uh, the, the latest S is uh, Saratobi. It's, uh, or Saratobi. It's, a, it's an iOS app that allows people to, it's a, it's a game that tips the players onto the Bitcoin blockchain. And this month alone, there was like 50,000 transactions within six, with, with six and a half uh, Bitcoin. So this, this, this mechanism is just spamming the network with a bunch of tips. Uh, so those are the, the three major ones. And I guess the other one would be uh, pay to script hash. Over a million coins have moved into that this past month. So the question for you guys is, uh, what, are, what are some interesting applications you guys see? And try not to use the word smart contract. In fact, from now on, we'll just use the word banana <laughs> instead of banana. <laughs> so for example. Why, why are we not using the word banana? <laughs> the reason we're, we're using banana instead of banana is because banana is overused on stage. People say, hey, I'm going to connect this chain with a banana to that chain. Or I'm going to you know, magically create letters of credit with a banana to be able to sell with people doing bill, bill of lading and so on and so forth. I so, actually think bananas are kind of important myself. <laughs> <laughs> bananas in theory are very important, but bananas in practice seem to be lacking. I so, think Tim woke up this morning and he, he looked at the topic and he said, like, smart contracts, what's the problem with this topic? I think it's too easy to understand. Let's, make it, understand. let's make it more complicated. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, let's be honest, though. So, uh, you've seen it lots in conferences. We do a lot of magic hand waving when we talk about bananas. So let's, let's, try, to, <laughs> let's, try, to, let's try to minimize that. So first question, uh, Steve, um, on, your, on your blog you talked about um, the babysitter, DC Babysitting Club. Uh, that I think Paul Krugman highlighted, and you mentioned how that could be a use case for something on a blockchain, I believe, back in October. Yeah, so um, uh, I think that a lot of the mainstream economics community has what's interesting about cryptocurrencies wrong because they look at Bitcoin as sort of a very primitive and kind of, from an economist perspective, stupidly arranged money substitute. So it's really easy to, to say from most of a, main, of a mainstream economic perspective that this is just a dumb experiment. It's a, it's, a, it's, a sort of, it's a decentralized central bank. Cool, that's interesting. But it's got a shitty monetary policy. And it costs a ton of electricity. It kills real resources for nothing. And there's this whole scammy economy built around it. It's really easy to just write it off. And so Paul Krugman, who is one of the economists who famously writes it off, um, back in the 1990s very famously described how monetary policy should work in terms of the DC Babysitters Club, which was a deal in DC, a bunch of families in DC who agreed, you know, you babysit for me and you get a token and, and I'll give you a token and then with that token I can buy babysitting services from someone else and we'll all babysit for each other. And he used it as a parable because there was a recession in that economy once upon a time where everybody was so concerned about wanting to be able to, you know, when there was a need, have a babysitter, that they started hoarding the tokens. They would babysit for other people freely, but they weren't spending them. And then all of a sudden the economy ran out of tokens. And his point was, you know, the solution to this problem was you just print money and distribute it to people, right? So this is a way of trying to get back at the really sort of gold buggy perspective of central banking. How can just printing money ever help? Well, here's a really simple example where printing money can help. But the reason why I think the, the babysitting token is a good way to kind of open mainstream economists' eyes to cryptocurrency 
is because it's very clearly an application where it's not some scammy, complicated, derivative financial contract. It's not about gold or gold bug. It's because we want to make a system in which there are real resources that we want to produce, consume, trade amongst ourselves, use, and we're just having a difficult time coordinating the problem. So on a network, we typically want to do things like, you know, we're going to maintain a ledger, we're going to offer storage and computing capacity, and we just need a way to organize some kind of market around that. And so this doesn't have to be a complicated thing. A cryptocurrency doesn't have to be cryptic. All it has to be is a token that represents something, and we need to invent a system like the DC Babysitter's Club where the token has some kind of a meaning and where that meaning is respected and we trade it and where when we run into problems, we can fix those problems with intelligent policy. And so in a sense, all of this experimentation around cryptocurrencies and around different algorithms and the ARIS group with their amendable chains are all ways of trying to give us the tools to invent something like a babysitter's club just on a much larger scale and distributed over computer networks. Man, I think you just made everybody upset with that. That's, that's cool. No, that's what we need to hear, right? Um, so um, Anthony, he, he wrote an article, uh, I guess a couple months ago, about BitNation. If you're not familiar with actually, could you tell us a little about BitNation and what your, your takeaway was? Yeah, so can you guys hear me? I don't know how, how close I need to hold this microphone. Um, BitNation is an attempt to recreate government services on the blockchain. Uh, the, the critique that I had about it was uh, when we created the systems of governance that we're ruled by now, uh, we were using very specific sets of technologies that we have forgotten were technologies. Uh, written language is a technology. Uh, the paper that we printed on is a technology. Um, the logic and the legal structures that we created uh, are all technologies. Uh, so to basically say, how can we upload this shitty 200-year-old technology onto the technology that we have today is uh, like the, the uh, critique of you know, trying to build a, a, a better horse as opposed to a car. Uh, so what well, the approach that I take is what is the function of these particular uh, these particular uh, systems and infrastructures and how can we recreate them in a more um, uh, uh, a more useful way for the for the current uh, technology that we have I, I mean I think that's one of the uh, really Im empowering and I think important parts about this technology. We can actually push ourselves from a paper error to a digital error. So I'm, I'm a lawyer, I'm a professor at a law school. I, you know, if you start thinking about all of the infrastructure that's built legally, there's a lot there that we can actually do. So, uh, you know, kind of building upon the governance system, if people really started focusing on voting and a, and a way to use the blockchain to build a voting system, and when you combine that with the things we talked about this morning, identity, you can actually start to build amazing opportunities for corporate governance. And, you know, voting, people think about it as this kind of, oh, we vote once a year, but everybody in the, on the planet votes. And uh, most businesses are run by voting. And it's all done by paper. It costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to run a proxy fight for corporations to take over another corporation. If you can build a voting system that makes that essentially costless, you're, you're adding real value. You're adding real dynamic, uh, dynamic, uh, dy a real dynamic aspect to the way corporations are run, to the way govern governance is run. And you aren't going to be re you know, rebuilding the horse. You're going to be building a more fluid, real-time system for everybody to be a part of at a, a significantly lower cost. I think over time, if we have a global payments rail, which is what we, what everybody has spent a lot of time thinking about, a global identity rail, a global voting rail, you effectively have governance in a box. You can actually export that to countries that don't have that. I mean, we take a lot of this stuff for granted, but in the future, we may be able to actually give that to countries and say, listen, you have a corrupt government, you can opt out of that. You can use our voting system here, which we know is at least fraud proof. It has a minimum amount of, of security for you to do things. Um, you know, and once you add kind of these things together, you actually get to higher level functions, like a judicial system. It's com completely conceivable that you can use all this technology to build distributed judicial systems. So if you don't have justice in your country, we could build that for them. We can actually have them and have people plug into a system that gives them that type of opportunity. And I think that's the real ultimate goal of what we should all be building towards. Um, so for a lot of us who are, are working on the technical side of bananas, um, <laughs> we, um, we spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, how do you trustlessly run code, et cetera. But one thing I noticed, um, you know, launching Codius and 
um, talking to you know people who wanted to use it for real world application is that you know all the real hard challenges are in the areas that that uh, Aaron mentioned um, when it comes to things like identity and, and actually moving money around into acting with the real world. And I think one thing that we should re recognize is that there is a lot of infrastructure out there and we don't need to switch from like cold turkey everything at once. Um, there's a lot of things you can do just by having um, you know specific parts of your smart contract um, <laughs> having specific parts of your banana enforced um, <laughs> automatically, <laughs> and then if there's a dispute, you go back and you fall back to the legal system, for example. Or um, you have, and, and part of that is just like going to the legal system is very expensive, and so if you can make that portion, that initial um, predictable case where someone is clearly defrauded, if you can make that cheaper and easier to enforce, that's already a huge win um, in the real world. I mean, talking about bananas is being a lawyer, talk about bananas <laughs> quite a bit. Um, but I mean, uh, y there's a lot of real opportunity um, that, um, y that I see that I don't know if everybody else does, but there's just a lot of transacting that happens um, that, I, that just needs to be updated. So a good example that I, I always like to think about is uh, payroll. I mean, the fact that we get paid on a biweekly basis in you know, 2015 is actually, it's incredibly silly. I mean, there's no reason why we cannot get paid in real time. And there's no reason why the government ca can't collect taxes in real time. Uh, I mean, these types of systems are now available because you have a self-executing uh, nature. And, and effectively, an employment contract or employment banana is, uh, you know, is it's self-executing. It happens. You know, nobody needs to stand over somebody's shoulder. It's an arrangement that's quickly entered into. And I think looking for those pockets where it's something that everybody universally does, that there's a lot of clarity to what happens, is really where there's a ton of value. I mean, complicated um, uh, bananas are, are are probably not going to be able to be built in the short term. Uh, contracts are in infinitely comp complex, but pieces of them are uh, can be. A, yeah, p yeah, there's certain pieces of contracts that can actually be com turned into computable language. I think which would be very helpful. So I mean, fin finance is uh, completely murky for a lot of people, but securitizations are massive, massive financial instruments, and they have waterfall flows, which are which can get actually very confusing and ambiguous. Just using computable language to to clarify that would add a tremendous amount of efficiency to markets. Uh, so Sorry, just to add to that one point, because uh, you mentioned these like waterfall models of, of contracts that built on upon contracts, and um, there was this documentary recently um, about the uh, you know the financial crisis and and how banks actually um, in the euro crisis are actually uh, specifically attacking countries, etc. A very interesting documentary. But the one thing that I want to point out from that documentary was that uh, they interviewed this banker and and they asked him, you know, how come your banks are so blatantly violating some of the contracts that they enter into, and he's like, well, you know that's really not how the bank looks at it the bank looks at it as like we have these three options right like the first option is um, we properly like we have agreed to this massive legal document which is like six thousand pages or something now we want to do something so the option one is we get a team of lawyers we hire a team of lawyers to go through that entire document and see if what we're about to do is legal or not um, that costs a lot of money it takes a lot of time the second option would be um, to go through the document ourselves you know legal layman and try to figure out if what we're about to do is um, legal or not also takes a lot of time and you also might get it wrong right you might not get it right if you don't if you don't have the legal expertise that you need and then option three is you don't look at the contract at all you just make a sort of like estimated get or, or you know educated guess of you know are we actually in violation of this contract or um, I if we are like how much is it going to cost and like what is the, the the total cost of that risk and maybe it's just okay to live with that risk um, and so that is clearly like if that screams inefficiency right that screams it's a very inefficient system if you don't even necessarily the text of a contract doesn't even matter because you might not even look at it. You might just sort of estimate what the risk is from violating it. Um, that's exactly. I mean, I've done plenty of those when I was in <laughs> private practice. I mean, that's that's how that's what everybody does, and they make risk assessments. That's what lawyers ultimately are supposed to do. I think the other area which is really exciting is is property registries. I don't think people realize how much these registries play in in a, a daily lives and how how much money that can actually be made from them. So copyright registry, everybody pays $35 just to register a piece of intellectual property, and they do it by on a country by country basis. The idea that we can actually build a global system for our, our, our land, for our, our intellectual property, to the extent that still exists, um, to, um, to you know, even security interests. So you know, people lend money, they don't even know the order in which the, the money was lent. I mean, these are really basic things that can get, uh, can get, can get cured, and whoever builds them, it's actually tons and tons of money. I think more money than you, you really um, um, might appreciate. Yeah, so speaking of uh, 
you know, property registries. Somebody, somebody came up to me and said, uh, Tim, there's a, uh, Greece has an issue. They don't have a central national database for property. They have all these different uh, silos. You have to go to law firms to actually find out who owns what kind of property. Surely the blo a blockchain could, could be the solution for that. So my question, I guess starting with Anthony, since you guys you were looking at developing countries, um, what's, do you actually see, see this actually as solutionism, or can, you, we, can we just go to like Oracle or IBM and ask them, hey, can we, borrow your, can we use your database to do this? Is this an actual problem that blockchains alone can solve, or is it, uh, what, what's unique about our space, uh, our banana space? <laughs> no, there, there are an infinite number of ways to solve any problem. Uh, and this is just the one that we've chosen, and I think that uh, the nature of revolutionary change is that uh, it's done on a level that is in the spirit of decentralization. Innovation is something that can happen in a centralized way, um, but truly revolutionary change is something that distributes power in a way that it hasn't been bef been done before. And so um, having a registry which can be controlled not by central entities, that we don't have to uh, rely on central points of failure, I mean, it seems very obvious. It just seems like a very obvious uh, uh, long-term solution to this problem. Even if we were to go to IBM or whoever and ask them to store this kind of information for us, uh, it's just a matter of time before we realize that this is a better way anyway. I mean, yeah. I think the, the real issue with property registries, on an, it's really international. So on a country basis, probably not a great idea. I mean, not uh, absolutely necessary to use a blockchain for it. But if you want to build global systems, you, you have Tr act actors that don't trust each other, and that's a great opportunity for a blockchain to come into into play because, um, you know, y they can trust the distributed ledger and not each country. So, uh, but I think all you know, property registries are, are challenging because uh, there is a, leg a legacy system that you have to convert over. There's a uh, uh, tons of sunk costs that needs to be taken into account, and just kind of the conversion. So I do think that those will come come last. But the moment that they do, you really you're liberating uh, the global economy. I mean, you can imagine if I could e just as easily buy a piece of property in China as I can in the U.S. I can't imagine that there wouldn't be a tremendous amount of value that that uh, that gets added to that. Steve, I have a question for you since you have very independent thinking. Um, so people talk about microtransactions as being some kind of holy grail that couldn't be done before. Um, and I know, uh, I'm not sure if Joel's here. Is Joel here yet? No. Joel Dietz, he pointed out, I think he's going to be on a panel later. Uh, he pointed out a paper from Nick Sabo talking about how you know, micropayments aren't a solution, or there's no solution for them because it's a mental issue. Have, have you, what, what's your view on, on, on this since people say, oh, we could do micropayments and enable people in developing countries or even here in the developed world? Uh, we could do these mini transactions that couldn't be done before. Is that, is that true? Is that false? What, what's your view? Well, I mean, I don't, I don't know. It's a thing to experiment, but I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical on the basis of the cognitive load argument. But I could be wrong. I mean, I don't have any great insight. Uh, that, you know, for you can economically, you know, you can draw a supply and demand diagram in pennies or micro pennies, or you know, multiply that by a hundred and say you're reading a hundred argument articles a week. It's just my own intuition is that I would. I would feel a certain gnawing sense of something if every day when I was sort of just browsing the web there was a there was a meter running or I knew that. But I, that could just be me. I really don't have an, any kind of. I, I think it's worth experimenting with. I think it's also worth experimenting with models that are maybe. Um, you know, lots of times we do things in order to avoid that sense of a gnawing expense where people invent pricing models that are you know, two-step pricing, like Amazon Prime. right? I buy Amazon Prime, even though I don't love Amazon, the company, but I really like being able to buy stuff on the internet without that gnawing sense of I'm paying a fortune every time to get it shipped. It just makes, it just makes the commerce easier for me. So I think there, there, there are lots of things in a, in a banana-driven world. I, I don't really think, but I could be wrong, that the metered microtransaction will win, but it's sure worth trying. But there are lots of other things that are worth trying too to address the same problem. This whole code word thing is also really good for against people who just post clips of YouTube videos because it will make no sense without <laughs> intro. <laughs> um, just to, to comment on the micropayments question as well. Um, so you kind of mentioned you, you you alluded to the psychological cost of a payment, right? Where you go through an entire payment flow, you enter maybe even your credit card details, you enter your password, etc. Um, and the way or what I would sort of compare it to is in many ways payments today are um, like the the information web or, or documents were um, before the the World Wide Web came about. 
Um, so a lot of things like communication was very explicit. Like if I wanted to send a message to someone, I would get, go open up my email program and I would um, you know, type in my email and I would send it off. Whereas today, like if you go to a website, your browser is sending you know, hundreds of messages just to view that one website and it's all happening without your involvement. So um, I think that just like having an efficient uh, fabric for information transfer has enabled a lot more computer to computer uh, communication. I think an, uh, an efficient fabric for value transfer will enable a lot more computer to computer payments and a lot more computer to computer value exchange um, than we're seeing today. Um, so, you know, just to, to try and illustrate this a bit more, like, you know, you might ask, okay, um, if my computer is paying on my behalf, how do I know it's not overpaying? How does it even judge how much it should pay, et cetera? Um, if you have a browser, let's say you, go, you have a browser, you go to a website, um, you are essentially giving that website a share of some of your resources, your scarce resources that you own, like your screen space, like the website gets a certain amount of screen space that it controls, gets a certain amount of your CPU, it can use a certain amount of memory, um, and your browser can make the assumption that you're willing to spend those resources because you typed in the URL and you're looking at that website, you're spending your time on it, um, so you're probably willing to spend some of the other resources to facilitate that interaction. And there's no particular reason and why money can't be one of those resources that you're expending when you're interacting with people. So um, just like that, like if you're going to YouTube or something, you're watching a video, um, you're already giving it all these other resources, why not also pay the uploader um, a tiny amount of money for um, you know, the time that you're spending watching that video? So are you saying that IBM <coughs> invented a depth which could get your refrigerator to buy bananas with bananas to compete with other bananas that are being shipped. Is that, is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> is it bananas all the way down? <laughs> I'm not sure, but I, I, I'm really hungry now, so. Uh, okay, so I know we're probably, we're probably running low uh, on time, so what, uh, I want to ask you guys uh, a question. You can take, take your time on it, though, uh, about pointing at somebody. Seven. Okay, so with, with the financial uh, services space, this is something that's actually, I've, I've been meeting lots of bankers actually quite a bit the last couple months, which is a good thing. They're, they're on top of things now. Um, so, and, and they're talking about settlement and uh, derivatives. That's especially the big case is because it's not so much fraud that they have. It's just uh, periods of, uh, of settlement they want to they reduce from two days to like instant, basically, because it reduces systemic issues. So my question to you guys is, wh where do you see this stuff being, the bananas being integrated with, uh, within the financial services space? Do you see it as escrow? I know you mentioned that before the panel. Do you see it, see it as uh, in terms of making derivatives faster, or in terms of settlement? Or well, is there any part in the, in the financial industry that could actually benefit? Should we just go and? Yeah, this order right here. Um, yeah, so from, from our perspective, like there has been some interest from some of our banking partners uh, in the space, kind of around uh, similar lines of what, what we talked about in terms of just lowering um, costs. There's also a lot of interest around just automating things, like where right now um, there's messages that get humans get pinged to do things because uh, ultimately someone has to go and interpret what the bank should do in this case. Um, you know, it'd be nice to have some of those rules encoded. And that, that's a process that's not necessarily novel to blockchains. Like people have been trying to, to create bananas for a long time. Um, but, uh, you know, there are certain things about like once you have multiple actors working together, um, uh, where blockchains become more and more important because you need sort of a neutral repository that everyone can agree to use. Um. I actually, um, with financial services, I think there's going to be a, a much smaller initial uh, impact just because financial services are so highly regulated uh, and financial services are, are very conservative so I think they'll look at it and I think over time much like on the internet you know the internet came out in 19 you know 96 and it really took until 2000 2002 till most banks really uh, adopted it and you know we're, we're fully allowing their consumers to use consumer banking and all these other things like that uh, so I know people have talked about you know replacing the depository trust corporation for for, for settlement of, of stocks uh, I don't think that the c the pain um, with regard to settlement of stocks is, is large enough that you're going to see all the banks jump onto that. Um, and in terms of, uh, s you know, but the things I think that they're going to look at is more uh, in terms of kind of controls. So things like accounting, I think that they're probably a little bit more interested in uh, ma internal management of their various systems. And I actually think identity is going to be a bigger issue now that we, we're starting to see, uh, you know, banks are, or banks are some of the largest networks that we have on the internet. I mean, they have uh, tons of consumers. They've, they're very valuable honeypots for any hacker. Uh, and I think the, the idea of actually like offloading a lot of that information to uh, something like uh, 
or some version of something like Open Name could be could be an interesting application that could actually lower their costs and, and might be a, a pretty good use case for them to explore with. Uh, but I think over time, you know, 10, 15 years, you'll start to see some of the stuff that people have talked about in terms of uh, decentralized markets and, and more, more of those types of applications, but not in the short term. I have a question for Aaron. Um, in terms of using the blockchain for property registration, yeah. do you see, um, like, what kind of bridge would need to happen for us to move maybe just incrementally from the current system of using paper ledgers or whatever in clerical offices to the blockchain? Like, could, could two people agree that we will transfer property on the blockchain and then somehow get the courts to consider that valid? Yeah, I think you're going to... Well, a, the banks have been trying to do this for quite a while. They've digitized a lot of the, the uh, property re registries in the U.S., and you know they've tried to, to make it easier in order to do these title exchanges. Uh, doing it contractually probably wouldn't work. You actually, you need to have clear title. You need to be you need to confirm that the person you're buying from actually has uh, title free and clear. Uh, that's why you have title insurance companies that kind of insure against the risk that they don't own uh, the rights to a piece of property. Uh, so I think, you know, I think property, title property is probably going to be the, one of the last things to jump on board, but the upside for it is so high that I think people eventually will do it. But there, there has been, at least in the U.S., a big movement towards, um, towards digitizing things, which is a big step. I mean, it used to literally be in every county, there was like a musty office run by like one person uh, who maintained the title records. Uh, for you know all the property in the county, uh, I'm sure it's similar in, in in you know other Western countries, maybe even in Europe, probably even more musty. So, I just want to point out to people that it's almost like these two different dimensions on which we're trying to, or these two different axes that we're trying to make progress on. Right? There's the automation axis where we're trying to get things at least digitized and at least automated, and then there's the decentralization axis where we're trying to reduce the trust in in certain actors. And we're trying to distribute it, and so. Um, I would say, like, wherever we can make progress in either of those two directions, like, it's forward progress towards bananas. <laughs> so I just wanted to offer actually two criticisms of some of the use cases of blockchains that were mentioned. So the first one is voting on the blockchain. And, uh, you know, it's a cool idea, but one of the things that I think some people <coughs> don't, uh, that I, I think is talked about much less often than it should be, is that one of the properties that voting tends to have in the real world is the world is this idea of <coughs> which means that you know, not only is it, is it the case that you can vote without revealing who you voted for, but that it's actually impossible for you to prove who you voted for after you get. And the reason why that's important is because if it's not, then basically people could sell their votes. And, you know, the, and, you know, and the thing that we had in the 1900s were basically employers saying, well, if you don't vote for this candidate, then you're not getting a salary anymore. So you know, that's, blockchains are, might be actually too public in order for, in order for that to be viable in some, in some cases. And second point on microtransactions, which is that, you know, people are talking about, oh my god, advertising, advertising is so evil, let's replace it by just going back to a payment model. But the thing is that, in my opinion, actually, advertising is probably one of the most beautiful things that the free market has invented in the last decade. The argument basically is that, you know, people talk about progressive taxation, and they generally say, well, the optimal model for taxation is that people should be taxed based on how much they're willing to pay. But and advertising actually copies that pretty close to it, actually, because even a, a homeless person can browse web pages and browse most of the internet, and they're basically paying nothing for it. Meanwhile, if you're if you're a wealthier person, you're browsing it, and then you end up, you know, you're, you end up indirectly paying for it when the ad, when the ads might encourage you to buy products. So you know, it's this really nice and egalitarian model in that sense. But if you substitute and you go back to, well, you have to well, pay a dollar to see this, then you kind of lose that to a large extent. So any comments on either of those? I think, I mean, I think with the microtransactions, that's definitely the tension. Uh, but I think you can also think of it as people fill up their, most people have cars, and they fill up their car with gasoline. The gasoline gets slowly, you know, depleted. I mean, you can imagine people filling up a browser with X number of dollars and getting it depleted. Uh, if, the, if the transactions were really micro and small enough, then it, it may not, it may not uh, have that, that impact. I think the, the area that I find interesting is just, you know, there's all these siloed content gar gardens now that are increasingly uh, popping up. And I think, I think, you know there is a pocket around microtransactions to kind of break those down uh, and to give you know uh, kind of a more equal access to it. I don't think the content producers, when they get siloed in a, like something like a Netflix or a, a Hulu or you know all these other things, they don't like that model. So I think they might actually be interested in microtransactions. And I don't. And the other thing that I think is helpful for microtransactions is there's a huge bundle of of bananas behind every single piece of content that gets created. It's, you know, just a piece of music. You know, in a traditional music royalty system, you know, if you have a composer who wrote the music that gets paid. You have a, um, you know, you have 
the, the person who records it, you have the, the, the label, which is effectively a venture capital for music or a curator of music. I mean, you can replicate those with a microtransaction system in a way that could actually incentivize more content creation. So. Quick comment on sorry. Uh, quick comment on uh, the point of advertising being more egal egalitarian. Um, so uh, you know that's true, but nothing stops uh, you as an artist to um, set a you know pay what you want pricing model. In fact, there's a lot of websites like Bandcamp, for example, which do exactly that. Um, so when I'm uh, giving you this example of like a browser paying for websites, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, the website will have to have a fixed price for you to be able to view it. It could be more like a um, a, a system where if I pay more, then maybe I get some like value add or something like that. So um, it really depends on the exact use case and what you're trying to do. Um, but I, I, I think people will come up with some pretty interesting models. Like where every time you look at these things, you w have to start with what are the transaction costs and like what is actually changing with the technology. Um, for example, if you look at something like YouTube, YouTube would have been perfectly possible before the internet. You would have just mailed VHS tapes around. You know, you, you send a VHS tape to Google, and then when you want to watch a video, you send them a letter, and then they send you the VHS address type up, right? Um, but the problem is that the transaction costs are way too high for that business model to be practical. So it's always like when you're lowering uh, the cost of business models, then yeah, you know, some industries are not disrupted. They work pretty much the same way that they did before. Like if I buy a car, it doesn't, you know, isn't that different because of the internet. Um, but there's other uh, business models that are very much disrupted. So I think that um, there's definitely industries where all this have a greater impact than others. Uh, as far as voting goes, the, there are a lot of assumptions being that we're going to need to vote for anyone, um, which, you know, if we go back and we ask ourselves the question of why do we vote for people and why do we need people to represent us, uh, we may find that we can construct systems which don't require that. Um, really, that kind of, uh, you know, there are, there are different kind of arguments that can be made as to why that may or may not be necessary, but one might be that... Um, historically you needed to get some person to be the voice that takes your particular concerns and then takes it to the centralized location where the government's occurring and now that we can have secure um, authenticated communication uh, it's really unnecessary um, but it does provide interesting things um, you could uh, one of the one of the areas of interest that I have is the quanti uh, quantifying uh, non-economic forms of capital so an election could be um, uh, modeled in in such a way that we all have equally uh, distributed uh, pieces of political capital that we then temporarily assign to a, a political figurehead, uh, which uh, in an, if we were going to optimize this particular system, we could have callability in that. We could, um, in real time, instead of doing polling, we could be like, I really don't like this guy. And then when it gets to the point where he's terrible, um, and we've all agreed you know, to the percentage that he's terrible, he's not we just call an election immediately. Um, but you know, these are all things that are gonna need to be worked out. Um, and when you rebuild the world, you can create models, but at the end of the day, you can just, you're gonna have to try and there will be problems and you'll have to hope they're not too bad. And I think with the regards to the voting, I mean, y there, there is some collusion that could happen, but I mean, you know, you could imagine a world where you have to, reg there's an identity system, you register a location where you're allowed to vote, like I, your home, and then, you know, you can vote from there. That would that make it difficult to, you know, per, you know, for somebody to bundle up votes and, and kind of do some sort of mass collusion of some sort. But there's always going to be, collu you know, the risk of coll collusion. But I think that I think if people gave enough thought, those are solvable problems. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just real quick. Um, uh, in a system, uh, so I don't know if, if what you were mentioning before is that we kind of have trustless systems and trusted systems. And in the trusted uh, branch, we're going to need to be able to develop reputation uh, and trust. And trust uh, is basically making yourself vulnerable to someone or something and them not taking advantage of it. So in systems that require trust, uh, the fact that they're exploitable is not a bug, it's a feature, and we don't want to get rid of that because human society can't run on money alone. It has to run on the social bonds between us, and we have to be vulnerable, but we have to be able to do it in such a way that it's incremental. Um, what, what we're doing is actually, I think, much simpler than what we think we're doing. What we're doing, because human beings, the human society evolved over hundreds of thousands of years to be very social, I, I think the distribution of our personalities is actually such that we are fairly, fairly stable uh, socially. So the problem that we're trying to solve isn't provide structures that regulate us, it's to scale the data that we already have. 
So we have this, these ideas of cultural capital and social capital and political capital between us. And it's not that it doesn't exist. It's not that people in this room don't know that I'm a good person. It's that if I go to China or, or Japan or Australia and I meet a new group of people, they, they don't know that. So the idea is if we can scale that data, it's a much simpler problem than re, like, uh, pretending we don't know what human beings are and we don't know that we're tribal creatures that evolved because we know that now. And we can, we can use those models to be a little bit more intelligent in the systems that we build. Sorry, that wasn't very quick. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll make a few. First of all, I'll be a little bit more pessimistic on that score because sure. I'm always a pessimist. I agree, actually, that uh, human beings are actually really good at kind of working things out and generating informal capital in and of ourselves. But unfortunately, in large-scale society, I think we've built systems intentionally designed to accommodate that and work around it so that we can exploit one another more efficiently. Yeah. So we look at you know what a financial system does. It might rob us of trillions of dollars, but the individual people who work at banks are usually very nice people, yeah. right? Um, except for the traders. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, as a former speculator myself. Um, but so, so I think, unfortunately, I, I agree in theory with your remarks, but I think in practice what we build now has to build from the fact that we have to replace systems that are intentionally designed, uh, not intentionally, that have evolved to be much more exploitative. We just have to outcompete them in the market. So, so yeah, we do have to do And so that brings a, a second point I want to address a little bit, which is that all this talk about applications of blockchains and decentralized technology and stuff, I just want to point out that it's all very supply driven. So we're all people interested in building stuff and excited about the possibilities. Um, and I think it's really important a little bit to step back and sort of take a chill pill and look around at what the world is actually demanding. And they're, they're actually not really paying all that much attention to us except for when the Bitcoin price goes <laughs> up or down. Um, and so I, I think a really useful exercise is to compare what we can do with traditional systems and what we can do with these decentralized systems and why there's an advantage. And the main thing, frankly, is, is just we're building an alternative regulatory scheme. And so that has two immediate advantages to suppliers, to people who want to build stuff. One is that we can deploy much more cheaply, right? When Ethereum is done, I can, you know, build a Kickstarter in a minute, whereas they had to go with lawyers and deals with Amazon and all kinds of stuff like that. So from a supplier's perspective, this alternative regulatory scheme is just a massive efficiency, and that's all it is. Um, there's also a regulatory arbitrage thing, which is because, frankly, we complain about the government, but the government's been really nice about blockchains and Bitcoin. It's intrigued, and it's letting us do things that in any other context would be outright illegal. There are tons of startups doing those things. And so there's a regulatory arbitrage that makes that all cheap. And so I think all of that's awesome because we can try and build new things, but I think one thing that is not in there, all this stuff we talk about and trust and decentralization, that's missing from all of that. I mean, our, our alternative regulatory scheme is kind of works and the government lets it kind of work because we tell this story about the decentralization makes it trustworthy. But as Vitalik told us earlier this morning, Bitcoin, not really so trustworthy, right? It's not really there. Um, so it's mostly at this point, we haven't solved those problems. So it's really a lot of branding, the decentralization stuff and a lot of hype. And a second thing that I would say why I care about it. So this is all problems, right? So it's great that it's going to reduce the transaction costs. And that's wonderful in and of itself. But we haven't persuaded the world that one, you know, we have to build the applications with those low transaction costs that will, that will make it worthwhile. The other thing that I think that we ought to emphasize more, the reason why I think the world should actually demand this stuff from us rather than us being so excited to supply us, is the potential for representation. Right, so aside from a blockchain being trustworthy because there's all this hash power out there on the network and it would cost you a lot, this is Elaine earlier said things about this, about trying to make the programming aspect less of a black box and more amenable to ordinary people. I think the reason why I should be excited about blockchain technology is because I want to live in a world where the organizations I participate in, I'm actually participating in. I'm not just a consumer. I'm involved in it, I understand how it works at some procedural level, I'm doing my part and my share to make it work and control its destiny. And so I think we should, we should think a little bit more along that axis.
Yeah, so I want to uh, comment on uh, your point, which is a really good point, that there is a sort of a disconnect between like us being the suppliers and like looking at what the actual demand is out there. And um, at Ripple Labs, I often feel like we're kind of like on the like on the border of those two worlds because like if i go to a bitcoin conference i get ba mostly asked about the decentralization axis uh if i go to a banking conference it's the exact opposite i get mostly asked about the automation axis and the efficiency axis right and it's just the the world out there and i think that um Again, like very often there are technologies that give us wins in both areas. Um, so those are obvious, wi uh, obvious wins. Um, and then uh, whenever we have to make a decision, you know, like uh, after all, like we all work for companies, we work for different nonprofits, we have to figure out like, you know, what do we need to do in our particular situation that, that helps us, right? Is everything. Do we have time for one question? All right, one question. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, somewhat of a response to uh, what Vitalik said about voting. Um, I think that Vitalik's concern about a uh, secret ballot being important is a legitimate concern, but I don't think that um, saying that you can't vote, uh, that the blockchain makes voting in public, I, I don't think that's true. Uh, I think the same, the same technology that we're using to prevent people from analyzing people's Bitcoin balances and how they're uh, spending their Bitcoins, so things like CoinJoin and Snarks that we were talking about, I don't see any reason why those same things can't be used to do a secret ballot voting on the blockchain as well. I'm going to try something very dangerous. I'm going to try to answer for Vitalik, and you can tell me if I got it right. Um, so uh, I think I don't think Vitalik claimed that uh, voting is necessarily public. He just said that it's provable, right? So you can, after the fact, you can prove... Yeah, um, you can after the fact like reveal to people like this is what I voted for. <laughs> so um, uh, even if you use something like CoinJoin, like the person involved in a transaction can always after the fact like reveal what they did and how what they did related to what was stored in the blockchain. Uh, CoinJoin only works if the person who is participating in the transaction actually wants to stay anonymous. Um, now, I'm not a cryptographer, so I can't speak to any kind of more advanced tricks that I may or may not be uh, uh, aware of, um, but that's the, the fundamental limitation. We're having another talk at five uh, five o'clock more about bananas, so stay around for that. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>